Good afternoon, Roy Oppenheim here. Uh, I know many of you uh, have attended one or two or three of our previous uh, webinars that we've previously done. I can't believe this is the fourth one that we're doing. Um, there's just a lot to go over today and we're gonna be talking about the PPP program, we're gonna talk about the SBA, and we're of course gonna be talking about uh, the impact on, on Florida real estate as it relates to this, this entire crisis. As a way of background, for those of you who are not familiar with our firm, uh, our firm's been around for 30 plus years. We went through the foreclosure crisis during the Great Recession, and historically, uh, our family uh, has been, I guess, uh, conditioned to think about worst case scenarios in life. We have relatives that went through the Second World War. We have relatives who've gone through the Depression. As we grew up, these stories were all, always part of our ethos. As lawyers, we always try and train and, and work for our clients thinking in terms of what is the worst case scenario and always trying to figure out what is the most hopeful thing that, that we can do for, for our clients. Uh, I wanna first of all uh, talk about uh, those people who helped us today. I wanna thank Paula Bagara who helped put this presentation together and of course my son Lance Oppenheim who's helping uh, me get through this today. And I wanna thank them as, as, as we proceed. Uh, particularly, we're going to be going to uh, slide number two, if we can, please. Uh, we're going to be talking about the PPP gold rush, as well as uh, the impact on residential commercial uh, property, both uh, small scale and large scale, service industry, warehouses versus storage, and of course, uh, real estate related businesses. Um, as I've indicated, our, our firm has, has been involved with these types of crises before. And we are here to basically serve as a guide to our clients to get through the immediate crisis as it relates to staying safe and staying uh, well during this crisis. And then talking about what's gonna happen on the backside, what the new normal, which is today, is going to look like as it relates to the next normal. Will it be more of a function of where we are today or a function more of the old normal? Or is it gonna be some sort of convergence? And we have to think about uh, how we're going to get through this, but more importantly, we know we're going to get through this. This is a war we're going to win. The only question is how long it's going to take, what kind of resources are we going to have to expand, and more importantly, what the backside is going to look like when we get through this crisis. Uh, besides Alan Pulowski, my, my wife and partner, uh, we have Jeff Sherman, who's our partner, and Paola, who I've mentioned, and we have Mia Singh uh, and, and Wayne Patton, who's of counsel, and I thank them all for their involvement in, in serving our, our community. Let's go to question number one, if we may. Oops, let's go back. Uh, this is our first poll question. Do you think that this crisis economically is worse than the Great Recession? Yes or no? Well, uh, it looks like, oh, we're, we're getting through here, let's go. Uh, a few people say no, some folks are saying it's too early to say, uh, and so it looks like it's yes, 30% or so, no, 8%, and too early to say. Well, let's go to the next slide, because the next slide is somewhat telling of, of where we are right now. Uh, this is a weekly unemployment rate. Last week, we showed that uh, the first spike in, in the uh, unemployment rate uh, went to around three and a half million. This next one, which is this past week, went to about 5.6, which shows about 10 million people have, have applied for unemployment. That is a number that has never been seen in the history of the United States. Even during the Great Recession around 2008, the number of, of folks that were applying for unemployment uh, never exceeded one million people in any one, one particular week. And of course, this is a, a very unique situation because by staying at home, and while we're increasing the unemployment curve, we are actually, at the same time, flipping this chart over and decreasing the spread of the virus. And I'm not here to talk about the virus, I'm here to talk about the impact on the economy and how we're gonna get through it. And by staying at home and sheltering in place, we're going to actually beat this war together. Last week, our discussion ended on, on the federal response and how it's, it's supposed to try and alleviate and ameliorate some of the the suffering, economic suffering that, that we're all having. This week, we're gonna talk about uh, that program and 
transformational real estate, to what extent the real estate will come back the same or will it change and what impact it will have on those people who've been serving the real estate community like ourselves for, for the past 30 years. The first thing we have to look at is human behavior. And that is, to what extent does human behavior change when certain new habits are formed? And so many of us have already been sheltering in place now for two, three, even four weeks in some circumstances. And it looks like, particularly in Florida and other parts of the country, that we may be doing this for an extended period of time. In fact, I just saw a study today that suggests that while New York is still obviously suffering, there is some indication that they are flattening the curve. While in Florida, we are several weeks behind New York City because we have a much older average population here that uh, we will be experiencing surges in, in the virus in the weeks and, and months to come. Uh, and so here we have some exa examples of the types of, of habits that change very quickly, but generally speaking, after 21 days, we start to uh, live differently if we start to uh, have the same kind of experience day in and day out, whether it's homeschooling or whether it's working from home or not using the office. Uh, those kinds of changes ultimately can have a long-term impact on our thinking. And that could include also not attending large events or being in, in social circles. To what extent, as human behavior, will we conform to that behavior or go back to something that we as human creatures are longing for, which is to be parts of our community. I do want to take a second to, to thank those individuals that historically are looked at, look, look over in society. And those are the people that, that conduct the mundane activities, whether like in this particular case, someone who's selling newspapers and snacks on, uh, on the corner of, of a street in New York City or, or somewhere else, or the, the medical community who's helping, uh, who are literally at the front lines of, of this war, the police, the fire, uh, the, the, the folks who drive the ambulances, and, and the people who work in the supermarkets to, to help those of us who are presumably at home right now watching this video. And to those people, they are at the front lines, they are the heroes, they are the soldiers in this war. So the first question is, uh, what is going to happen to large venues? And here we have an example of an a AMC theater. AMC is likely going to be filing for bankruptcy shortly. They've hired a bunch of lawyers to, to restructure the company, but that usually means that they're going to be filing for bankruptcy. And the question is, what happens to that space? What happens to that company? What happens to that landlord? What happens to the mortgage companies that have provided the debt? What happens to the bondholders? What happens to all the people in line with this kind of domino effect that's going to have in, in the economy? What's going to happen to the film industry? How are films going to be distributed? It's going to affect entertainment. And so it's, it's, it's a massive, massive change in, in, in behavior. And we have to figure out and sort through it so we can figure out how we all come out of this ahead. Are we next question? Uh, okay. So the big question is, of course, uh, what's going to happen to large events, sports, uh, uh, concerts, large restaurants, clubs, and, and we'll talk about that in a little while. But I want to go to question number two. Before, and don't go to the next slide. Yet. Let's go to the poll glance, if you can. It's, it's uh, which areas? Question two. Okay. Uh, do you think this crisis? No. Next question. Okay, here we go. Which segment of the commercial real estate market do you think will be hurt the most? And I give you a choice. Office, apartments, healthcare, net leases, or self-storage. For most, for those of you who are not familiar with net leases, net leases would be like a, a big box real, uh, uh, big box uh, uh, store, uh, such as like a Walmart or, or a Target, where they are paying just a, a flat rent, and they're also paying for their taxes, their insurance, and, and the cost, and they're just paying uh, a, a rent to the landlord, and they're also paying for all the other expenses associated with that. So which ones do we think is gonna be hurt the most? And we have here, uh, office looks like number one, apartments, healthcare, probably the lowest, net leases, 21%, self-storage, 18. So this was a trick question, I'm gonna show you what the answer is, and I would have thought maybe the same. Okay, so can we, can we go to the next slide? Okay, if, if we actually go to the next slide, page 10. Okay, uh, we're actually gonna see that healthcare is tied probably with hotels, it's probably going to do the worst. And people say, why healthcare? And the answer is because so many people are starting to recognize that telemed is going to be the way of the future, that many kinds of visits that we go to to a, to a doctor's office can be done via video and telemed and through technology. And so the amount of office space that healthcare facilities are using can be cut very, very substantially. And that's becoming 
something that in the future is going to clearly have an impact on, on, on rental rates for certain kinds of, of spaces. What we're finding is that data centers and towers and self-storage are actually being hurt the least, and we'll talk about that further, but I just wanted you all to know that, that um, we can all be fooled by, by not fully understanding how human behavior is actually changing the course of, of the real estate market as we listen to this conference today. Next stage. Okay, I wanna go to the PPP, and I know a lot of people are, are, are interested in this. Uh, this is the payment uh, the payroll protection plan. This is supposed to be the cornerstone of the administration's way to try and bail out small businesses. It's a 350, $350 billion uh, program. It, it represents maybe slightly more than 10% or 15% of the entire uh, CARES package, which was a $2 trillion package, obviously 200 billion being 10%, uh, so it's around a 15% or so program. And we wanna go to question three before we continue. Question three, how many of you have applied or are planning to apply for an SBA emergency loan? And that includes any kind of loan that, that, that the SBA has, and that includes grants also because they're called loans, but of course much of that money is, is not, doesn't have to be repaid. Okay, so we, we're not, we have a lot of folks, as much as 44, 45, I'm not sure they qualify. I wanna talk about that explicitly. Uh, we have a bunch of people who intend to apply, and I suggest you apply quickly, and I'll explain why. And 34% congratulations if you have applied. So a third have applied, 25% want to apply or plan to apply, and they need to move quickly. And the other folks who are about half don't know if they qualify, and we need to figure out if you qualify today or not, because you don't want to be left out in the cold. Okay, let's go to the payment protection plan. And this is, again, the cornerstone of, of what is supposed to be uh, the administration's way to, to bail things out. I will say compared to 2008, it's where, where the government gave the money to the banks, thinking that the banks would use the money to help bail out the public, and in fact did not do that for the most part, and used it to buy back their stock and pay, pay bonuses and, and other nonsense. Uh, this time, at least the administration is trying to get some of the money into the pockets of little business. But one of the problem is, is their definition of little business or small business is not that they're all small businesses. Multi, multi-million dollar companies are being qualified as small businesses. If you own 1,500 Arby's, for example, you can apply for each and every single Arby and, and get hundreds or, 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 or tens of millions of dollars through this program versus someone who maybe owns a nail salon who may be only be able to get forty or $50,000 from, from the program. So let's talk about a little bit who qualifies for the PPP because this is a, a critical component. And, and what, what I do want to talk about is actually on page, um, I'm on page 12, if we can just go back, oh, we're on page 12, is, is that none of the money from any of these programs has hit the street. Whether you've applied for unemployment uh, under the new program, uh, where you're supposed to get a minimum of $600 a month, uh, whether you've applied for the EIDL, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, where you're supposed to get up to $10,000 within three days of applying, uh, or whether you've applied for the PPP. I don't know a single client who has received this money. The nature of these programs is that this money has to hit the street as soon as possible. It is actually kind of like helicopter money, which we talked about last time, by pouring as much cash into the economy as possible to get the economy going. Right now, we're looking at, at a form of deflation, we're looking at a form of stagnation, where the velocity of money is slowing down because anyone who has money is gonna hang on to that money to pay the necessities of life. But once we stimulate the economy and we get cash into the economy, we can actually revive the economy while we're trying to beat, and, and I'm not saying trying, as we beat this virus. Uh, a lot of these loans are not new, but they've been re-envisioned. They never were meant for a nationwide program. They were meant for disasters in particular places after hurricanes or tornadoes or, or, or floods, but they were never envisioned to be a nationwide program. The SBA is currently trying to employ tens of thousands of people to help them process this as our banks, and, and, and right now, it's unfortunate because the money is still not flowing. Okay, let's go to the next page, please. Okay, the payment protection plan. In particular, the most important thing for those of you who are on the call, and I, I noticed that I know many of you who are on the call today, and I wanna thank you for, for supporting our program today, and, and more importantly, if you have questions, it's very important that you ask questions because we're going to save some time at the end to answer as many questions as possible. But the first thing is, 
no one really knew about what to do with the 1099. So those are independent contractors, people who don't receive a W-2. They may be self-employed. They may have a corporation. They may be a realtor. They may be some sort of service provider. And they're issuing some, themselves a 1099 and not W-2. The answer is that they, uh, they themselves do qualify to apply as an employer, as a company under the Payment Protection Plan. As employers, if you are paying 1099 employees, and of course that's a, a misnomer because if you're a 1099, you're technically not an employee, but if you are a 1099, so for example, if you were in Uber and you were paying all these 1099s, you are not eligible to, to include the 1099 income in the calculations, which I'm gonna go over with you, but rather each Uber driver, technically speaking, can qualify as a small business and apply for the payment protection plan. So that's very important, I wanna repeat that. If you're a 1099, you are eligible to apply for the payment protection plan. If you are an employer and you are a general contractor and you have no employees and everyone's a 1099 because everyone's a sub, your subs can all apply for the payment protection plan. You can apply to the extent that you're paying yourself and issue a 1099, excuse me, a W-2 to yourself or a 1099 to yourself because then you could apply but all the 1099s that you're issuing, other than to yourself, those people have to apply for their own payment protection plan. But if, for example, you are an employer and you have a $100,000 average monthly payroll, what we do is we take that, that payroll, which is a W-2, and we multiply, we, we, and that's your average monthly, so you have $1.2 million worth of, worth of payroll. But if you have a $100,000 payroll for the month, we would take that payroll, we don't include W-2s, excuse me, we don't include uh, 1099s, we only include W-2s. We deduct those incomes for those W-2s that people make over $100,000 in 2019. So if you're someone who makes 120, you reduce them to 100. You take that amount, you multiply that average monthly by 2.5, which is basically 10 weeks, two, two months, and then, and then half a month, so that's 10 weeks. And that becomes the amount of money that your loan is going to be forgiven to the extent you then use that money in 2020 to cover your payroll. You're also permitted to use 25% of that money for other expenses. And let me tell you what those expenses are. Those are expenses are rent, mortgage payments, utilities, and maybe one or two other general expenses that are considered overhead. To the extent that you do that and you use that money for based on your 2019 calculation for 2020 payroll and for rent, those loans don't remain loans, but in fact become grants and they are forgiven. And the reason for this and the public policy behind this is instead of just everyone applying for unemployment, we're looking at small business as the engine for the American economy to keep businesses in place, to keep hiring people so that we have enough small businesses that will still exist after this crisis. If only 25% of all small businesses exist, it will be a very long and arduous task to rebuild this economy. If we can keep enough small businesses working, they can grow, they can expand. And it, it's kind of like, and I, I think I may have mentioned this last time, it may, it's kind of like a car that, that sits in a garage for months at a time. Generally, the engine's going to be bad. You're going to have to drain the oil. You're going to need, need at least a need a new battery. If we can keep these small businesses going and keep the engine tested and keep the battery going, it is much easier for those small businesses to be able to rehire people and, and to build and grow. So just again, if you had a $100,000 average monthly payroll, not including 1099s, not including people over, over 100,000. So if someone's making 150, you bring them down to 100, you take that amount, you multiply it by 2.5, which means a $250,000 loan, and then you can use 75% of that to cover your payroll and the rest of it, which is a little under 50,000 if you do the math, or actually a little over 50,000. 250, 25, 50, a little over 50,000. You can use that money to pay your mortgages, commercial mortgages, and your commercial rent. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, the importance of, of having a banking relationship because there's a lot of shenanigans going on. The application opened at 12.01 a.m. on Friday, and it was a frenzy, it literally a gold rush to see who would get, get the loans first. And the answer was that those people who previously had borrowed from the SBA, from an existing lender, seemed to be the first online. The next people that were online with that were people who had a banking relationship, meaning they had a checking account or savings account with a particular bank, and more importantly, also had borrowed money from that bank before. Many banks are not going to take new 
uh, clients and new borrowers at this time. And the reason is, is they're worried about fraud and they're worried about the SBA coming back to the bank and saying that they didn't vet these loans properly and they could be on the hook. Even though the SBA guarantees a loan, there's a certain level of due diligence that they're expecting each bank to do. But since these loans are happening so fast and so quickly, the banks rather lend the money to people with an existing relationship. We in fact have a client from a particular bank that got a $100 gift certificate from a particular bank because they were the first client in the United States that got their application in over, over the weekend. So, so far, as of last night, there have been 130,000 loans that have been processed. No money has hit the street yet that we know of. And of that 130,000 loans, $38 billion of a $350 billion program has already been basically designated, which means that almost 10% of the money, over 10% of the money has already been allocated. I suspect that within 10 days, this entire program will, will be over oversubscribed. And one of the, the downsides to this is that if you are in a sole proprietor, you can't even apply for this loan for another few days. I forgot the exact date. Paolo, who's listening, could, could probably give us the answer. But I think it's around the 10th of this month, it will open up to sole proprietors. Sole proprietors are generally people who don't even have a corporation. They're, they're just an individual, and, and, and they're issuing 1099s to themselves. The average loan amount, by the way, was $350,000 on Saturday or sun by on Sunday, and the average loan amount has dropped a little bit to $292,000. So if you have any questions on this, please go over, uh, please ask, and we're, we're going to proceed. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, let me see here if I may, uh, about the different segments of real estate and, and, and how they're going to be affected by this based on, on, on behavior changes that we're starting to see. Well, the first and most obvious is the fact that uh, head Headquarters is now the new home. The home is a new headquarters. And we're all learning how to telecommute. Commute. We're using Zoom like crazy. Uh, the internet, of course, is busting at, at the seams. And so the question is, how are homes going to be redesigned differently in the future to allow for homeschooling, telecommuting, and people working? I mean, in our home here, we have my, my adult kids are all here, and we're all working as, as, as I do this today. And, and it's just not how we ever designed the house, but we're fortunate that, that everyone has found a little nook and cranny somewhere to, to do their work. And so the question is, how are homes going to change, redesign themselves? And of course, the other question is, to what extent are people going to feel comfortable living in communal environments, whether it's condos, ACLFs, or even living on a cruise permanently. I mean, there, there were some worldwide cruises that people were living permanently on cruises. And the question is, are these the kinds of environments that we're gonna feel comfortable living in going forward? Or are we gonna go back to the old normal and, and, and say, sure, these kinds of environments are, are, are fine. Let us move on to page 16. Okay, a as I indicated in terms of, re yes? What, is a question? Okay, oh, another question, sorry, I apologize. Uh, Okay. Uh, do you know when PPP loan forgiveness will be calculated? I know it will be after June 30th. The question is specifically when. Uh, actually, my understanding is it's a it's it's a 10 week period or an eight week period. It's an eight week period that you get to choose anytime after February 15th. And so you and your accountants and lawyers will decide what that eight week period is. That that is my understanding. I'm not sure if all the rules have come out on that, but that that I think is is how they're they're planning on proceeding. Okay, let me, let me, let me move on to uh, residential space, page 16. A as I was saying, uh, the real question is social distancing and to what extent will that become a, a continuous theme in terms of how we organize our, our lives. Are urban spaces going to be exactly the same? Are we going to feel comfortable living in apartments and high rises? Do we have choices to do that? And if we do have choices, are we going to be preferred to live in a single family home versus multifamily? living in a, in a, a suburban uh, or exurban uh, community versus necessarily in a city. I mean, cities historically have thrived over, over the millennia and, and, and people used to live much more in, in cities than they, than they did on the farms. Of course, uh, in China, we've seen people come from the farms into the cities over, over the years. And so as, as we have evolved, uh, these, our cities have grown from some cities that, you know, like New York, which are eight, nine million people, to, to other cities like Mexico City, there are 15 and other cities that have 20, 30 million people. And the question is uh, how that is going to impact our psyche and, and, and our sense of, of security uh, in terms of feeling comfortable, in terms of choosing places to live, particularly if we're going to choose a place to live where we may also be working. Okay, 17. I want to talk about foreclosures. The last crisis evolved to a large extent around the foreclosure 
crisis and where uh, many people were losing their homes because they lost their jobs and the banks continued to foreclose. As bad as that crisis was, people were able to move into other, other homes with their families or were able to double up. There wasn't an overlaying health crisis associated uh, with, with the crisis. And of course, Florida was ground zero. And of course, I, I have a number of my colleagues who were intimately involved with us with defending foreclosures and, and, and helping uh, underscore how, how the banks were involved with unscrupulous behavior. This crisis seems to be different. And so right now, foreclosures are, are, are not the big issue. People are being told to stay in their homes. Uh, evictions have slowed down. When this crisis is over, uh, then the banks will gear up their, their, their foreclosure uh, mills. A lot of the mills right now have laid off some of the lawyers. They, 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 they put them on, on furloughs. And so they're, they're, they're waiting to get the green light to rev up and again, throw people out of their homes. However, the banks have learned that if too many properties are foreclosed at one time, they will drive the prices of homes down. And so their very inventory that they pick up will have less value. So what they will likely do is create a slow drivel of, of foreclosures and, and try and do workouts with people and do forbearances and modifications and the necessary deed and lose so that they can figure out a way how to get the economy going. The type of bailout that we're seeing this time is based on the lessons that we learned last time. And so while there will be lots of foreclosures, I'm not sure if there will be a foreclosure crisis like there was last time. You know, I think the first homes that are going to get foreclosed will not be a primary residence, but they will probably be vacation rentals, that'll be Airbnbs, there'll be maybe duplexes or triplexes where, where they are technically residential homes, but not necessarily truly commercial homes, and where folks were relying on the income month to month to pay their mortgage. And with that income not there, or their income being diminished because the rents will be much less, those foreclosures uh, will be the first ones that we're going to see. And that will, of course, start to drive down property values. But hopefully, they, they won't be as precipitous a drop. Uh, but that will be a function, of course, of unemployment. And if you don't have a labor force and don't have folks who can afford to pay their mortgages, then you, you could have a very, very serious problem. Of course, right now, we want to tell people that this is a keen opportunity to modify your mortgage if you can. If you still have your job and you're lucky enough to still you have a job with unemployment still only being around 13%, uh, right now, I say still, because it's going to go up very substantially, we would advise you to get your loan refinanced now while you still have good credit. There may be a point in time where you lose your job or you have destroyed your credit and you will not have the opportunity to modify. We suggest you modify. Our title company, Western Title, is exceptionally busy right now as it relates to helping folks modify their loans. And I encourage you to do that as soon as possible. Uh, I do want to talk about unemployment. We were just talking about this, and this is a, a fascinating slide. So during the Great Depression in the, in, in the early 30s, we saw an unemployment rate that, that almost hit 25%. During the Great Recession, we saw an unemployment rate in 2010 that, that peaked around 10%. And in 1980, there was actually another period of time where unemployment actually hit around 11%. And that was uh, uh, during, I guess, the malaise of, of the, uh, the oil embargo and, and the Iran crisis. This time around, we're not sure what the unemployment rate is for the month of March. It will come out in a few days. It is projected to be around 13%, and April will probably be around 20%, and May will probably reach the levels of the Great Depression. And then the question is, uh, will this exceed that amount? And to the extent that it does, uh, this will end up becoming one of the unfortunate historical economic disasters in the history of our nation and probably the world. Okay, let's talk about commercial real estate, small scale. If anyone knows this film, uh, unfortunately, we, we, we decide not to do polling questions, but you're welcome to tell us what film this is from. It's, it's one of our family's favorite films. And uh, it is, uh, of course, the, the Truman Show, where the sailboat is crashing into the wall of, of, of the set. And uh, it's a very poignant picture, and, and I think it suggests exactly what, what, what is happening to us. We had what, what appeared to be a very robust econ economy up to maybe the last, the last week in February, first week in March, and then we literally hit the wall. And the question is, what is behind that wall? So the first thing is small businesses. A as we suggested, there is a really a, a question of to what extent th this is an existential threat to many small businesses. Some are predicting that as many as 75% of all businesses are going to end up uh, 
out of business. And so it really depends on, on whether you believe in option A or option B in terms of our path out of this process. The first is that yeah, when in fact we get the all clear sign, are people gonna go out and spend like crazy uh, without fearing a second wave of the virus? It may not be safe, but it certainly be fantastic for the economy. Many developers are saying that we're human creatures and that we long for human interaction and that the minute we get the all clear, people are going to be spending money like it is the end of World War II. The other option, which we're seeing in other parts of the world, certainly in parts of China uh, and, and, and other parts of the, country, the world where, where things are getting slightly better, is that we're seeing cautiously people are starting to spend, they're starting to go out with stuff, face masks, they're not getting on airplanes like they used to, they're not going to hotels like they used to, but they are starting to go out, they're shopping, they're trying to get back to some sense of normalcy. The real question is, and again, I'm not a doctor, is there are really three ends to this. And one is that kind of like the chicken pox, everyone gets infected with the virus and their, and their antibodies go up. And of course, there could be great, great loss if that were to happen. The second is that people end up uh, getting a vaccine and that the rest of the world is, is able to then stave off the, the, the spread of the disease. And the third, of course, is that this becomes an ailment that is treatable through various kinds of medicines where you don't have the kinds of fatalities that you have. And there are other viruses, such as AIDS, for example, where that is exactly what happened and people were able to live with it and society ultimately was able to beat it. And so the question is, which route are we going to go? And that will be the answer to option A or option B. And it depends really uh, what the course of medical history is when, when we get to this, this perspective. So retail and services, uh, on, on a small scale. As we indicated that you know, up to 75% of, of small businesses may not make it. And so the, the question is, are people you know, gonna continue to stay at home and not consume things? Or are they gonna uh, eventually go out? Uh, small retailers are sometimes no different than the rest of the population. They are relying on this week's and this month's income to pay this week's and this month's salaries and, and, and expenses. Uh, there will be logistical limitations such as shipping, uh, which could uh, have a great impact on, on business. And, uh, and, and, and so the real question is going to be, uh, what is going to happen to, to small brick and mortar retail? And I'm not talking about small retail on the internet because we'll talk about that in a bit. Next. Restaurants. So the question is, you know, you have different kinds of, of elements of, of restaurants. You have fast food and you have fine dining. And so a lot of uh, fo folks are thinking, that the fast food folks will remain in business because the kind of food that they're providing is survival is based, it's not expensive, and, 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 and it's sustenance, and, it, and it'll certainly provide uh, an immediate need. Fine dining gets more difficult because it, it relies on people who have discretionary income, who feel like being among other people. And the question is to what extent people are willing to go out and experience that. And the answer is it really will depend on the unemployment rate and how quickly the economy comes back. Fast food will come back faster than fine dining, Obviously, there are always people who do have some money, and so there will be fine dining still available, but the question is, how much fine dining will there be, and to what extent the appetite will be there? Next. I did want to mention that home cooking is having an impact, of course, on all of this, because uh, we're all becoming great chefs and, and bakers, and, and if we're not, we're certainly, certainly learning how, how to do that. Okay, let's go uh, to gyms, clubs, and other social venues. Again, the issue is gonna be safety versus social desire. To what extent are people wanting to go to a casino and be among a bunch of other folks versus just maybe going to smaller venues and feeling more and more socially distant when in fact we, we get the all clear and partial clear. I do wanna mention that in parts of the world, including Italy, certain people who've had the virus and who in fact are getting, uh, who, who are demonstrated to have the antibodies, they're almost getting a passport to be able to go out and start to circulate because they are, they are safe. And the question is, would we tolerate that in the United States or not? And to what extent will the Italians uh, actually tolerate that? So some people are safe, some people aren't, based on whether or not you have the, the antibody. Okay, let's talk about commercial large-scale real estate. So the first thing is, you know, high-end big box stores like Neiman Marcus. Well, Neiman Marcus was, before the crisis, having way too much debt and was always teetering. So the likelihood is that they're gonna be able to survive is, is probably unlikely. Nordstrom's, on the other hand, had been experimenting with smaller boxes, becoming more like showrooms where uh, you'd have an experience, but they wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily actually make the final purchase there, but you'd order it based on that actually feeling and touching the item, but not necessarily taking it home with you. And so uh, many experts are suggesting that the Neiman Marcus model may, may 
not survive, but the Nordstrom model may be the new model. For restaurants and movie theaters, again, it's going to uh, depend on, on people's uh, social desires and, 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 and whether or not uh, this particular problem gets ameliorated through uh, a, a vaccine or, or through medicines that, that will make this just a, just a, a common ailment. Um, and other stores, um, different kinds of specialty stores will likely uh, still provide some sort of an experience, but, but many stores are, are realizing that they can do quite well online and reduce their, their overhead. So winners, uh, we'll go to the next one. Uh, the winners that we're looking at for big boxes are, are clearly, and most of, this can, most of us can figure this out, is, is the Walmart, the Costco's, the Home Depot's, and supermarkets. Supermarkets have become like the newfound uh, prize in, in our community because they are the folks who are feeding us, keeping us alive, and of course they're the folks who are taking the risks of, of going to work every day, the workers at these supermarkets, and they are also part of the un, unsung heroes of, of this narrative. Uh, again, we're talking about uh, different shopping experiences for high-end boutiques that have a panache and offer some sort of unique shopping experience, they'll probably do okay. But your, your, your gaps of the world, your, your old navies of the world, it's unclear if, if, if those stores and those kinds of stores will necessarily survive. And what impact that has, of course, to the strip mall, to the mall itself is, 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 is very complicated. And of course, the lenders of, of, those, of those facilities and of course, the, the real estate investment trust where, where Wall Street has put money into, into malls. And, and the question is, to what extent are those going to be valid and viable investments in, in the future? So let's talk about the service industry because many of you are, are like ourselves, are servicing the real estate industry. Um, and so let's first talk about hotels. Hotels are, are, are interesting because they rely so much on other industries. They rely on the travel industry, the convention industry, and the cruise industry. And so to the extent that those industries are all harmed, hotels by their very nature suffer. The cruise industry we all know is, is on mothballs. The airlines uh, are barely flying even though they are. And then uh, the impact on, on hotels is, is a direct correlation of, of, of providing those services. Question four, let's do question four before we go to the next slide. What? Uh, we're gonna go to question four. Okay, last question if we may. Okay, that's question one, question four, okay. Will you likely immediately attend large events, concerts, sports, casinos, malls, once the government allows these facilities to reopen? It's either a yes or no, or it depends. Oh. Well, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So over two thirds of us are saying no emphatically. The it depends is about a third and 11% say, oh yeah, I'll just go to a sporting event. Almost no one, 10% are saying that they're going to do that. And so that is going to be the problem. To what extent can we get a vaccine going to make us all feel comfortable that this is no different than, than a, a common flu? And to the extent that, that people don't have that sensation, they will not go to large venues. They will not go to sporting events. They will not go to concerts. They will not go to theaters. They will not go to movie theaters. Uh, and they may not even go to large restaurants and clubs. And so a lot of real estate is in that sector. And, 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 and you're talking about billions, if not trillions of dollars of, of real estate that's just lying fallow right now. And the question is, do those things come back? Do we reinvent those, those, those facilities? Do they remain hospitals? Do they become schools? Do they become residences? what happens to, to, to those facilities. And I don't have the answers to those questions. All I can do is pose those, those questions. And I do wanna mention one thing which is really interesting. Because we are all not driving right now, many insurance companies, particularly Allstate, is going to be sending rebate checks to their insurers because your car is in a mothball sitting in your garage or on the street. And because of that, uh, they have less accidents, they're spending less money, and you as a, as a, as, as a insured are getting a rebate on, on your policy. But the, the consequence of that is you have less car accidents, less lawyers who have to have to defend the accident, less lawyers who are going to bring the, the, the personal injury claim, and less underwriters, less mechanics, and it trickles down through the whole, whole process. And so it's not just big events, but it's, it's the alternative way that we are now 
uh, evaluating how we spend our time that's going to have this, this dynamic impact on the economy and ultimately how we use our spaces. Warehouses versus storage. Okay. So large warehouses right now are, are short supply and high demand and they have emptied out because their inventories are, are coming down. But it will take time to get goods moving again through these spaces. And so to a large extent, some of these large warehouses uh, may in fact uh, be overvalued. Small warehouses uh, may actually be more valuable because they're designed to store goods for a shorter period of time and to feed online retailers that would be needed. Uh, and they're also good for small deliveries and, and for folks who are gonna start building maybe a home business out of their garage and need a, sec a secondary place to store their, their inventory, even if it's masks that many people are making at home, home right now is a good example, or, or baked goods or anything else that, that they may be doing. Data storage facilities, obviously by definition because of the high internet traffic, uh, the big boys are all gonna be building larger data farms and data facilities, and, and so that kind of real estate we, we anticipate is going to continue to do quite well. Okay, okay. Uh, let's talk about real estate related businesses, if, if we may. Uh, let's talk about realtors. Obviously, there are limited showings right now. There are virtual showings. I know some realtors are still going out. And uh, while they, they can do that, they have to be very, very careful. And most homeowners really don't want people going through their homes right now. So it's really very, very tough. In terms of commercial realtors, uh, there are numerous issues of, of tenants who are not paying their leases. Of course, those landlords then have to deal with their mortgage company. In Broward County right now, as I may have mentioned, uh, there are, uh, there's a moratorium on, on evictions. And so uh, everyone's in a, in a standstill for this big sleep that we talked about last, last week for this 60 or 90 day period. Uh, but the real question is, is it only going to be a 60 or 90 day period or if it's going to be a lot longer? As I may have indicated earlier, there are experts that are suggesting that Florida is going to be one of the, the last states to come back because of our, our, our older average population here here in Florida. Uh, and of course, because everything is moving online, uh, the question is, are some of the, the mom and pop retailers that, that we have in our strip malls going to still be viable? I'm not talking about the nail salons and the hair salons because that's a service industry, but I'm talking about more about folks that, that, that provide some sort of good uh, in, in, in the strip mall. Of course, the other question is, will the personal salons come back online? Uh, because many people, as we've indicated, or you all have indicated, are, are not that keen to go to the large facilities uh, because of, of the potential spread of the virus, I would think that that would also apply then to go into a personal service rumor, whether it's uh, for your hair or, or, or for any, any other personal service, uh, such as your nails. So we've talked a little bit about refinancing. Interest rates are low right now. Uh, refinancing is, is probably a very uh, good thing for you all to look at. So mortgage brokers probably should, should remain busy, except the jumbo loan market, which is going to have an impact on realtors. We're hearing that, that many banks are not going to continue to make jumbo loans because they are not backed by uh, the various government agencies and the, and the banks do not want to assume that risk. Uh, Wells Fargo said they will only make jumbo loans if you put a quarter million dollars in their bank. And if you do not do that, they will not provide a jumbo loan to you. And I suspect that many other lenders are going to do that to try and, and increase and shore up their deposits by using that as a, as a way to, to build business. But it's also going to mean that a lot of people aren't going to have that quarter million dollars in cash, especially in this economy right now. Uh, and so the question is, uh, what's going to happen to the jumbo market? And of course, what's going to happen to real estate that exceeds the jumbo market, meaning anything over uh, five or $700,000, depending on the market that you're in. We expect a slower pace. Uh, businesses and, and municipalities are running on skeleton staff. The, the lean searches aren't coming back quickly enough. Uh, inspections aren't being done quickly enough for, for new construction. And so everything's going to slow down because of that. And, that. and that's just a fact of life, unfortunately. Remote notarization, of course, is, is, is the only green spot. Of course, our, title, our Western Title Company is, is highly involved in that, and we've been promoting that. And that's a way to, to continue to get uh, business done without actually physically having to be in a closing, being in a huddle, being with a bunch of people breathing on you, but instead doing it all online. And while there are still kinks in the process, uh, we're, we're happy to say that that process is moving very quickly, not just in Florida, but in all 50 states. We talked about lenders and brokers. Uh, requirements to qualify are clearly going to get more difficult because uh, so many people are going to be unemployed. And so again, if you are planning on buying, you got to do it while you still have your job. We have seen a few situations where people have lost their jobs in the middle of the closing process. Uh, 
in the, in the days before the closing. And of course, they've had to retain counsel to try and figure out what to do because now they don't have their loan, but they were in the process of, of closing. And so those, those situations, of course, are always unfortunate. Uh, I'm, I keep being told to hurry up here, which means that we have lots of questions. And so we're going to get to the questions. Okay. First question. As a realtor receiving a 1099 from the broker, do you qualify for unemployment because of the virus? Uh, and the answer is uh, you would uh, uh, qualify for unemployment, but you also would qualify for uh, the, the PPP. And so the question is going to be, which way are you gonna go? Whatever you do, do not go both ways, okay? You can't say you're unemployed and you're also an employer. Choose your poison, choose your pill, take it and see which way to go. And sometimes it's a hard analysis of whether or not you wanna go with unemployment or if you wanna go with the PPP. And for that, you need to speak to your accountant and your lawyer and see which way you qualify. I'm a realtor, okay, we did that, can I qualify as an independent contractor? When should I apply? Well, yeah, I, I, most realtors get 1099. So if you get a 1099, by definition, you would, you would qualify. But unemployment also goes for gig workers this time. That is something new. Unemployment historically did not go for people who were 1099s, and that was a major, major change in the definition of the unemployment insurance program, which probably is gonna be a systemic change that will go on for many years. There are millions of people, again, whether you're Uber drivers or realtors, who are technically gig workers, you are, you're, you're an independent contractor, and so you can apply for unemployment. And in many cases, that may be the way to go because it's a simpler way to go. And, and because there's so many applications, it'll probably be a faster process, even though initially it will be slower to qualify. And by the way, anyone who's trying to qualify by calling, may I remind you that we are no longer in the analog industry. You need to go online and apply. Next. Okay, as a real estate owner, uh, as, as, are real estate owners allowed to get the PPP loan? Well, the answer is gonna be, do you have a payroll? You know, do you just 1099 yourself or do you have a whole payroll? If you just 1099 yourself, then yes, you are a 1099 employer, uh, employee, and yes, you can apply for yourself, but just owning real estate itself wouldn't qualify because remember, you have, it's calculated based on, on your payroll for last year on an average month times 2.5. So if your payroll is 100,000 for the year, and your average payroll is $8,000 a month, you would get eight times 2.5, which is $20,000 would be your loan amount, which would be forgiven if you use it for those purposes. I am a single owner, escort, now next one. Does the SBA regulations allow the idle or PPP property owners who self-manage? Uh, the SBA does allow for the idle. You're supposed to be able to get that $10,000, uh, but if you self-manage and you issue a 1099 to yourself, yes, you would be entitled. The only question is how much, because you're limited to, uh, your payroll and that payroll can't exceed any one employee that makes more than $100,000. So if you pay yourself $100,000, you would be entitled to around $20,000 uh, in a uh, PPP loan. Next. I'm a single owner S Corp with one employee, yourself. Uh, I pay myself a mix of distributions and W-2 wages. I know already that only the W wages will be eligible. My question is, do I need to wait until 410 to, no, you're not, you, you should not wait. You are not a sole proprietor, you are a, you're a corporation. And, and so by that, uh, you, you should be able to apply now and you should be able to, to qualify for your W-2 wages. Your distributions, absolutely not. The profits have nothing to do with this. This has to do with employment income, not, not, not covering your, your, your profits, how you define them. The fact that you want to lowball your, your W-2, not pay your taxes or your full taxes, now, you, now the consequence is there. That's why you know you all should be always paying yourself a salary, always paying the social security. And for the next hundred years, I'm sure people are gonna realize that you're better off actually issuing a W-2 to yourself when you work and also taking distributions, but taking distributions only above maybe that $100,000 mark. Next. If your bank is Wells Fargo, they put on a statement that they are maxed out on the PPP loans and are not taking anyone's applications as of the fifth. So what do you do? Are there banks? There are some banks, apparently, if you go online, they'll match you, but this is exactly the kind of problem I was talking about and why I indicated in my last seminar that people were going to have to move very quickly. On this. And so you can go on the website and there's some matching program, but I, I would be very concerned of, about that being successful. And I think you may have to wait for the next iteration of this PPP program when Congress, remember Congress is on, on, on vacation now for a month for, for Passover and Easter, and for spring break. And so we're not going to actually see new, new legislation till probably mid-May, which would probably not take effect till then. So it, it, it's terribly unfortunate, but I think the answer is 
Uh, you can try and go through another bank, but since they don't know you, you don't have a bank account with them, you don't have a loan with them, it's going to be difficult. And, and that, is the, that is just the reality of it. Next. Do you know if I can apply more than once? Example, I'm a 1099 realtor, and I also own a duplex under an LLC with my wife, and we already have one tenant not paying. Uh, you may be able to apply if you have two companies for the idle uh, uh, and get the, you know, up to the $10,000, but in terms of your PPP, uh, you may be able to apply if you have two payrolls and you're not paying yourself twice. I mean, you, you can't go in twice and you certainly can't go in to get more than $100,000 uh, because that, that would be a form of fraud. And you need to list all your companies on these applications so they understand how, how they all work together. Next. Okay. The loan on the duplex is on my primary as rates and terms are cheaper, not sure. Okay, that's a little too detailed. I, I'm going to have to skip that. I, that requires almost a legal opinion. Okay, are the people that have not been able to get their applications in on, on this call or, or being, are there people that have not been able to get their applications in on this call been turned away or been turned away? I don't know if anyone's been turned away yet, but, but people are probably being frozen out by the technology, uh, by, by the systems being overwhelmed. I know Bank of America system collapsed uh, Saturday morning. Uh, and so, I, I can't express the importance of getting this in in the next several days while the program is still open. This program, by the time we have another seminar, will probably be, be close to max. And so, uh, you know, it's just so funny that, you know, four weeks ago, I had folks who were complaining to me that, that I was uh, somehow making people more nervous and upset and that, and that we were in, in, in some way exacerbating the situation. And, and all we're trying to do is give people some guidance so they understand the consequences of delay, the consequences of waiting and knowing what their options are. And so there are some people who I guess didn't believe this, this, this threat and, and God bless them, but, but we understand where we are and are gonna to continue to guide you. My, my recommendation again is when you get off this call is you try and get on your bank's application for the PPP loan or in the alternative, apply for unemployment online. Okay, thoughts on Airbnb. Well, in terms of Airbnb, I mean, most people who have Airbnbs are, are, are not getting the income right now. If they're not getting the income right now, they're probably not gonna be able to pay their mortgages. They should either call their banks or they should call us and get a forbearance agreement for the next few months so they don't have to pay their mortgage. Uh, in terms of Airbnb as a company, I don't wanna, comment on that. I know Airbnb has unilaterally in some ways uh, sometimes refunded people in violation of the underlying agreements with, with, with the, uh, the landlords themselves. I'm not sure what their terms of use are and they're permitted to do that, but it's quite possible that they did violate their terms of use and, and we would be interested in looking at that further. Okay. Your perspective on the practices of churches and nonprofits. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if that question is, but churches and nonprofits uh, are uh, will more funds become available for nonprofits and churches? Uh, the funds uh, under the PPP are available for nonprofits and churches right now, 501c3s and religious organizations. Assuming they have a payroll, they, they should be applying like everybody else. Uh, but there's no special uh, uh, program for, for churches and, and nonprofits. Uh, can you do international remote notary? Uh, yeah, if you get me on an airplane and, and fly me there, uh, but guess what? I'm not going anywhere. Remember, international civil law notary requires me to get on a plane and go anywhere in the world where we have where we have diplomatic relations and I can actually notarize documents. In theory, you should be able to use RON, which is remote online notarization, but that typically doesn't work because unless you're a U.S. citizen, the questions they're going to ask you uh, will not be relevant because they're always U.S.-based questions, security questions that you're going to be asked, like where you lived or what your last school was or what your, what your car was, and, and, and that the system will not be able to ask those questions if you're overseas. Historically, international notaries could go anywhere in the world to collect notarizations as if they were in Florida right now because they cannot get on an airplane or won't get on an airplane and won't be able to come back. There's limitations on the international notary front. Okay. Can you do PPPL and IDLE? Yes, you can. Uh, if you get the $10,000 uh, branch alone from the IDLE, I think it, it gets deducted from your PPP. Is it a good idea to apply for a reverse mortgage? Well, you know, reverse mortgages have always been very interesting. They're a little expensive. For those of you who don't know them, they're, they're kind of like equity lines that you don't have to pay back. The older you are, the better the underwriting is. Um, and, and I would say that, that they may be a perfect, uh, uh, they may be a perfect thing for someone, usually around 70, 75 years old to kick in. If you're in your 60s, they, they really don't work that well. But certainly once you hit in your 70s, they, they could become a great opportunity to pull out cash, especially if you do not have a first or second mortgage on your property and it's free and clear. How long does it take to hear back from the SBA once you apply? I will let you know next week because I know no one that's, that, that has heard back other than to say, yeah, we got your documents, here's your confirmation number, you're an idol, the EIDL, 
four, yeah, congratulations, you processed, here's your dashboard, we'll get back to you. SBA loans is different than the PPA. No, the, the PPPA is a type of SBA loan. If you go to our website, there is a, a coronavirus section that lays out all the different loans, which also is what we had laid out previously in, in our last week's presentation. But all that information is there to give you links and whatever you need to figure out what all your loans are, or you're welcome to call our office and we'll help you navigate that. Can you talk a little bit more about the item? Um, yeah, I did. Uh, we talked about it last week, but the most important thing about the EIDL is that th there is a grant component of it. So the first $10,000 is in fact dischargeable if you use it basically for payroll or, or other particular expenses. Otherwise, it's a low interest rate for about four, for around 4%. And for the first six months, there is no interest. Uh, and I would recommend that you apply for both. Just because you apply for both doesn't mean you're going to get both. And just because you get both doesn't mean you have to take the money. But I recommend that right now, uh, from the history of all these kinds of economic crises, the people who are able to stay uh, with cash and, and keep their powder dry are the ones who come out of this the best. Next. Our company bank, Wells Fargo, told us that they are no longer accepting applications. What do you do now? Uh, you know, I don't shoot the messenger. I don't have a crystal ball, but the answer is going to be uh, have a secondary banking relationship or go online and, and ask that the SBA match you with, with a lender. The problem is that the process will be slower, and by the time they do that, the money will have run out. But I still recommend that you that you give that a shot. Can you apply for both programs? Okay, we asked that already. Thank you so for this info. Will you discuss unemployment benefits for realtors, freelancers, independent contractors? Okay, so as we talked about, uh, if you're an independent contractor or a freelancer or a gig employee, it, a gig in the 1099, you do have a choice. You can either apply for the PPP and, and get uh, the equivalent of two and a half months of your income that you would pay yourself under a 1099 uh, or in the alternative, apply for unemployment. You cannot do both and you have to decide which works better and what is better for you. If you don't have a banking relationship, then yes, you're going to have to apply for, for unemployment. If you do have a banking relationship and they're, and they're going to let you qualify as a PPP loan, then that may be better, but you have to do the math and see where you're going to come out ahead. And that's that always... Is, is a mathematical equation that we can do or that your accountant can do and we can help you with. Can you apply for more than one PPP if you own multiple companies? Yes, you can, provide you have multiple payrolls. And it's not like you are on each payroll and paying yourself $100,000 at each company because the maximum that you're entitled to is $100,000. Now, mind you, there are severe, severe penalties of both cash and imprisonment if you're going to try and defraud the United States. Also, there will be individuals who are going to bring false claims acts against you and your, and your company if, if they're part of your organization and they know that you're trying to defraud the company. And there will be lawyers out there that will encourage people to, in fact, go after employers that are trying to rip the system up. And there will be a cottage industry of lawyers that will work on, on bringing these whistleblower actions against unscrupulous employers or individuals who are going to double or triple dip. So I advise you that if you're going to do any of this kind of stuff, that you have a lawyer and accountant with you because that will be a good defense if in fact later on you're accused of having doing something. It may be one thing to say you, you have to pay the loan back with interest as opposed to it being forgivable versus being accused of having committed outright fraud and, and, and the government bringing criminal charges against you or bringing a, uh, a, a whistleblower action against you where there, there could be massive damages and, and attorney's fees. Can realtors apply for unemployment benefits and the ten thousand dollars grant? No, no, they, they can't. You're either going to apply for the idle loan, and you're going to be an employer. And and, and I don't know if the idle even even goes to to uh, necessarily realtors, but we know the PPP does. But to the extent that the idle, if you can apply for the idle as an independent contractor and the the PPP, the question is going to be: Is that still a better deal for you than applying for unemployment? The other question is: Are you truly unemployed? You know. Uh, or are you actually still getting income from a deal that's about to close? Yeah. You know, if you're going to get income from a deal that's about to close, I guess you become unemployed from the day after that. But do not apply for unemployment and then have money come in and say you're unemployed. And so in those cases, you definitely want to apply as a PPP or EIDL loan. Yes. The unemployment is $600 per week for four months uh, for everyone, depending on my 1099. Uh, it, it's, it's a minimum of $600. And the excess above $600, which is around $235 or $250 in Florida, will depend on a sliding scale based on how much your income is. So if your income was rather low, you still will get the $600, which is a lot more than Florida used to pay because that money is coming from the federal government. But it may not be the $235 or $250 because your income was low. If you're, if you're making a decent wage, then you probably will get the maximum of the $600 plus the maximum that Florida pays. 
of somewhere around 800 bucks, eight and a quarter uh, a month, a, a week uh, for uh, a period of four months. And so in many cases, that may be the, the best option. Okay. Uh, if people who have applied for unemployment in the past is applying this considered a first time claim? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think they're still going to uh, look at, at your history of unemployment and see for how long you, 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 you applied. And if you've applied too frequently and have been paid too much in unemployment, you may have to wait a certain period of time. That's a good question. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, my client got a denial from the lender after getting a conditional approval and now the financial contingency has expired. Her escrow money is in risk and the seller will claim the deposit. Can she still fight and deny? Yeah, I, I would certainly fight. I wouldn't release it. I'd hire a lawyer. We're doing a lot of that and try and negotiate a, a settlement and, and work something out reasonably. Uh, if they're going to have to go into court, it's going to take them weeks and months. They're going to have to pay their attorney and, and, and the courts really aren't going to have the patience for this when, when they, they start to open up. So I think what we have to do is be reasonable here. Understand you've caused a lot of hardship to the seller who may have moved out and they have to move their stuff back in. And, and, and this is, you know, under those circumstances that you may want to call force majeure or shit happens depending on, on your circumstances. Are you available for consultation? What's your phone number? Well, I think most people know our phone number. It's 954-384-6114. You can certainly uh, contact us online and, and we are, are available. And we, we do have special rates for those people who mentioned that they, in fact, have uh, seen us on, in, in these seminars for the next few days. And, and we thank everyone for keeping us in business and we thank everyone for, for, for supporting these, these efforts and asking these great questions. Uh, Okay, also, if you'd be kind enough, uh, on our website, www.oppenheimlaw.com, we have a COVID-19 uh, coronavirus section that, that continues to evolve, and there's a lot of good answers to, to many of your questions there today, and we also talk about the kinds of situations that, that we're dealing with uh, on a daily basis. A again, let me see, uh, my dear friend Evan, uh, not a question, just a comment. It's interesting that some people think you have a, a bit too doom and gloom. I think you've done a great job. Thank you, Evan, in finding the right balance. I have many people in my ear, including a surgeon and a bank lawyer, who think, oh, we are teetering on the brink of another Great Depression. Thanks for this valuable dose of sanity. And, and, and we might be, I mean, we, we may well, that's Evan Rosen, who, who uh, has been doing foreclosure defense with us over the past 12 years, is in charge of a, a great group of lawyers and has been a hero to, to, to the bar in, in that context. But, you know, we may be at, at a Great Depression and we may be at a, an event that's similar to 9-11 or the Great Recession or World War II, whatever it is, we're going to beat it. And the question is how, and, and the first answer is by staying at home and not letting this thing spread and then figuring out how to use your time most valuable while you're, while you're home, whether you're taking courses online, whether you're learning to cook, whether you're on this Zoom meeting, whether you're gonna to continue to work like we are, you're gonna remain productive and you're gonna help society in, in, in some way. And, and we are going to continue to be your guide through this process to get you uh, through this immediate problem. And then when things start to open up to figure out how we all can, can get through this for our next year. I mean, this is something that never in my lifetime I could have envisioned. I mean, the foreclosure crisis was something that I thought was going to be the pinnacle of our life. It was the most busiest time of our life. It was an insane time, and we felt very good about helping the people that we did. Never in a million years could we ever have contemplated that that was really just a rehearsal for something much more dire and much more severe because of the health consequences that we're dealing with, not just the economic consequences. One more question? Or no, I'm being told that's it. So Zoom at noon, Roy Oppenheim, I'm gonna see you next Tuesday. Uh, if any of you be kind enough to tell me what you would like me to talk about next week, uh, just just text us in this, in, in, in this forum right afterwards so we can have some ideas. My sense is we're just gonna to continue to talk about the issues that our clients are having to get through the day and the week and to keep their businesses open and to figure out how to apply for unemployment. Stay safe, stay well, and Zoom at noon, Roy Oppenheim. See you next week. Thank you.